scripture reading for Kevin's lesson will be taken from the 25th Psalm, verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> be reading from the New American Standard Version, Psalms 25, 16 through 18. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. really good to see all of you, and I appreciate, again, the continual opportunity to be here. As the week went on, and my weeks lately have just been stressful. Gene was asking me how things were going on at work, and I said, terrible, even though I just got a promotion. Um, I just all of a sudden now lost a couple people that work around me closely that knew a lot of answers. They've now departed, so my job is becoming that much harder because now I'm trying to learn something, and there's no one to teach me. So my support staff is not there for me, so then just kind of stressful there. The greenhouse business is just really blooming, if you will. The business is overflowing, and just, just the capacity of people is amazing, but it's just, you know, the month of May is really tough for us. So getting through this month and hopefully progressing uh, in the days ahead, hopefully I have some hope, but I've realized the last couple mornings I'm not wanting to get out of bed. I'm just so exhausted and wanting to lay down, and, you know, there's a couple times I just, when I lay down in bed, I just want to let go, you know. I told my wife one day, I said, I just want to let go and fall. <laughs> she, what do you mean by that? I said, I've never skydived, but I would want her to the feeling just to let go and just fall and just keep falling and keep falling and just never hit anything. But just to be in such a state of just relaxation and, and just be so light is just kind of what you want to feel for a moment. And just the burdens of life that you encounter. What I've also realized is that as life hits us, at some point within those things, we still have a responsibility to be a Christian. We still have a responsibility of being a spiritual person. But within that uh, task and all the other job tasks that we have, we also have a responsibility but also a privilege to get better as a Christian. So as I'm trying to focus all my efforts on my new job and all the things going on there, I definitely want to make sure that Kevin is still emulating Christ-like things. And that should be easy because that should be who I am, right? But then you also get the frustration and the daily, the mundane tasks that come up. And you just know what? That, that I'm working hard over here and I just can't get anything accomplished. And now the boss wants ten more things and it's just my list just keeps piling up. And the responsibilities that I have and the things that I, I want to do and opposed to I need to do, what the wife needs me to do, what the kids need me to do, and the work job and, and my church and everything else that I want to do, it's just becoming overwhelming at some point. But within all those things, again, I have to circle back and say, what's the most important thing of everything that I do? And it still has to have a spiritual center. So then I also question myself within all that, I said, well, one thing we have to make sure that we do within all the things that we do and all the responsibilities and when things get overwhelming and stressful, not only are we trying to safeguard our spiritual nature, right? Making sure those outside influencers don't change our attitudes, still emulating Christ, but what I'm also still trying to do is get better. Becoming a stronger Christian, more faithful person, more loving person, and sometimes those things just don't come easy, again, when everything else, all the other burdens and stress and life and demands are coming your way, where I want to sit down and take time to study the Word, where I want to pray about things other than just help me get through this job task today. I want to focus on other Christians and church-related activities and, and responsibilities. And I want to look at my life as a Christian and still work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I want to take time for myself and really devote that energy towards God because I know what I haven't done that I haven't had the time or the ability although I had the desire to do so 
just, just that 24-hour time frame isn't big enough. In reality, if God gave us more than 24 hours in the day, we would just fill it up with something else. We really wouldn't use the extra hours or whatever it be to focus on Him. So my point in all this is this looking back at my life and saying, I still want to get better. Every day that I wake up, I want to get better. I want to keep striving to become that, that, that better dad or better father, or better husband, better co-worker, better Christian, better brother in Christ. And you might be way up here in, in, in that level, and that's great. Some of your levels in life, maybe as a dad, maybe I'm lacking. Maybe I haven't spent time with my kids the way that I want to. But they still know that I love them. So just taking the moments in our life to say, you know what? There are many things important in life, yes. There's many things that we have to do right now, yes. But we have to step back and say, you know what? I still want to get better. God wants me to get better. I need to get better. And that's not to say, again, that I'm a terrible person. It's not to say that I'm lacking extremely in some things. It's just the whole mindset is I still need to always get better. There's still opportunity to grow in some facet of my life. But one of the things I did notice within doing this and looking at this, and Psalm 25 is where we'll be, so if you have your Bibles and you want to join me there, you can. But I will, be, I will have it on the screen again. But I'm going to focus all of our energy in Psalm 25 today. And what I noticed reading Psalm 25, and I'll get to it in just a moment, is that this is a psalm of David, and he's going to recognize God's position. He's going to recognize some things that he already knows about who God is and what God will do. But he also turns his trust towards God and the fact that he has enemies against him. But he also turns his efforts towards God, that God, you're going to help me. You're going to teach me. You're going to instruct me. You're going to guide me. You're going to help me grow in knowledge. But in that same process, God, he's going to turn to God and ask God to forgive him. And it almost seems like just the kind of continual process here. And you'll notice it as we go along. And what I want you to notice is, is this your continual process? And I'm going to already tell you in the beginning of this lesson, this is me. This is my process. And it just has unfolded to be that way. When I read Psalm 25, I'm like, this is Kevin. This is kind of me in a nutshell. And I'll explain it as we go to it, and maybe you'll fit through this, and maybe you'll glean some things and help some understanding that will help you get some, through some things in your life and become better and strive to, to be better. In Psalm 25, right off the bat, he says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. So obviously he recognizes that, that God is God. He is the Father. He's the creator of all things. And where is he going to strive for to his efforts? To God. To God, what am I doing? I lift up my soul to you. My attention, my efforts, my being, who I am, my love, everything that I am, I'm lifting that up to you in worship and in praise. I'm looking to you for guidance. I'm giving you gratitude and thanks for who you are. I'm going to give you my soul. I'm lifting up my soul. My Who my being is is yours. Okay? It's not someone else in my family. It's not my job. It's not my responsibilities there. And he's not saying he's taking his efforts away from anyone or anything. But his position is, I lift up my soul to God. Because he knows that that's where the source of all the knowledge and all the help and all the guidance, all the deliverance, all the forgiveness, that's where it's going to be from. He says in verse 2, oh, oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Now, many of us at some point in our time, we, we think about the word ashamed in a sense that we put all of our hope and trust in God, and all of a sudden the world goes, where is your God? Okay, again, enemies rise up against us, not, not necessarily in a physical battle, but we have enemies, right? And they say, well, why are things going wrong in your life if you have such a great God? Well, let us remind something here. When you become a Christian and you become a follower of Christ, that doesn't mean that everything in your life now just that's bad just wipes away. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden now only good things will come your way, that you won't have any obstacles or challenges. It never means that you'll never be tempted again. Of course, God doesn't tempt you, but Satan does. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have stressful situations. It doesn't mean that someone's not going to hate you or be an enemy of you. What it means is now that you have someone who will guide you in all understanding of the fact is that the world is full of sin, yes. 
But also God gives you the understanding and the knowledge of how to get through those things, how to stand firm in those things when they happen. So again, those things will happen, yes, but you'll also understand why those things are happening so that you stand with an understanding, but you also stand victorious because you'll get through those things a whole of a lot easier than anybody else. He says, but in God here, he says, don't let me be ashamed. Although my enemies rise up against me and they're fighting against me, God, don't let me to be ashamed. In other words, to be your child, that I am a Christian in this sense. Don't let me be ashamed in the sense that I'm going to labor for you. I'm going to strive for you. I'm going to put on your name in my life. But don't let me be ashamed in the sense that I'm going to be defeated by my enemies. And he knows this fact, that, that not, not necessarily that, that the enemy will defeat him, but he knows the fact that God will defeat all the enemies. He knows that God will protect him. He knows that God will defend him in any way, shape, or form. It's just the assurance, again, and recognition of who God is and what God is going to do for him. God is not going to let him be ashamed. So why is he even asking for that fact? It's just the recognition of the fact is that God won't let him be ashamed. Okay, Do not let my enemies exult over me. As if God was going to let his enemies over him. No, not at all. But it again, it's just the reassurance of God. I recognize who you are and what you will do for me and what you can do for me. And in verse 3, it says, Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. So don't let me be ashamed. But again, those who wait for you won't be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Okay. So anyone who waits on the Lord, stand firm in the Lord, be patient with God, trust God, you won't be ashamed. Why? Because God is working in your life today. He will bring about the, the necessities, the provisions for you today. More importantly, one day he will come and he will smote all your enemies and he will rise you up and give you the crown of glory. So the recognition here that those who wait for you, who trust in you, they won't be ashamed. However, on the flip side of this, he says those who deal treacherously in verse 3 without cause will be ashamed. Because they're not trusting you. They're not uh, following you. And in a sense, they're, they're allowing their enemies to rise up and defeat them of who they are. And in verse 4, and then I'll kind of bring some of this back full circle how it applies to me and us today. In verse 4, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Okay, and that one kind of seems simple in a sense, right? Make me know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. And one of the things that I think that as we strive to get better, that's something that we don't necessarily call upon Lord, the Lord to do, right? We want to learn it, we want to grow in it, but we don't want to read our Bible, right? I don't, uh, the, the Bible's boring. The most boring book in the Bible for me ever is Leviticus. I'm just telling you that it is, okay? But Leviticus is very important to the Old Testament and the understanding of all their sacrifices. How are you going to worship God if you don't know how to worship Him? Read Leviticus, okay? Now, it's not the boring in the fact it's not the worship part of it. It's just I got to, you know, there was a lot to it, okay? And maybe you're just not a reader, period. But now when you go through it and you understand it and you have the, the knowledge of those things, the application of that worship service becomes that much more easy, more peaceful, more understanding of who God is. And you have the desire to do that. Make me know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Because, again, I want to get better. I want to become who you want me to be, God. But I can't do that if I don't know you. I can't do that if I don't read your Bible. I can't do that if I don't understand your word. How are we ever going to get better if we don't know the path to get better? How do you even know that you even need to get better in the first place if you don't know what God's standards are? So invoking God to help you understand those, ask, seek, and knock, and He will open those doors for you. Teach me, God, those things. Help me to understand you. Help me to grow toward you. And verse 5, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, for you I wait all the day. The reason why we want to get better, that we need to get better, it goes back to verse 5 here. For you are the God of my salvation, for you I wait all day long. I want to come to a greater understanding that you are truly God. Now we know that on the surface, right? But experiencing God all the more in creation and our lives help us to understand that all the more that who He really is. Because the more that we're putting this focus on ourselves... We fully understand and we have this more vision of what has God done for me in the past, but what has God done for me now, and what is God going to do for me in the future? 
I was re- listening to the radio the other day, and they were talking about people calling into the radio, telling them about the last time as God has blessed you. And so I thought for a minute, when was the last time God blessed me? And then I thought, man, it was a second ago. It's now. It's every day that I breathe, He blesses me. I mean, what do you mean when the last time God has blessed you? If I'm alive, I'm blessed. If I have all not my family and our health, and if we have food, we have clothing, and the basic necessities, I'm blessed, right? We think about the physical thing. Well, you know, I pray that, that, that God would, would, would bring this to me, and he brought it to me. I mean, it took him three years to do it, but he finally blessed me, right? We've been blessed so much in our lives that we take it so much for granted. And I think we come to this mentality of what I want, what I need. And if we ask for it and we don't get it, and all of a sudden, well, I'm just not blessed. There's a person that I work with. Every time I ask this lady, I said, how are you? She goes, I'm blessed. I finally asked her one day, I said, what does that mean? I mean, is that just something you say? Or are you blessed, really? And to what measure are you blessed? What, what tells you you're blessed? The fact that you have a job and you have money and you have a home, the fact that you have health, is that why you're blessed? Or is the fact is that Jesus is our, our Lord and Savior and He's died for our sins and He's made the way for us to have salvation and you have partaken of that and now you're ready to go home and sit at His side? What makes you truly blessed? Leave me in your truth in verse 5. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. It's having this understanding of who God is and His patience and kindness. Trusting God that in His time He'll bring about things that you, He knows that you need. And again, putting that trust into Him and knowing also in the same breath that th- this life doesn't matter. That we have a future heaven and ho- future home in heaven one day. But trusting in that mere fact. And in verse 6, remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. It's amazing here that the writer is asking God to remember. Why don't we remember this fact? Well, God, remember here. Remember something, God, that you are a compassionate and loving kindness God. Well, he knows that because he is. But why is he asking God to remember this? Notice verse 7. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me from your goodness sake, O Lord. So remember God, okay? Remember, remember, don't you forget that you, God, you're compassionate, you're loving kindness, okay? Great. However, don't remember <laughs> my sins, okay? How are you not going to remember my sins? Because you're compassionate and loving kindness, right? So don't remember my sins. So he's looking at God, and not necessarily he's asking God to remember who he is. More so in this verse 6, he's, he's recognizing who God is. That God, you are compassionate, that you are loving kindness. I am a sinner, however. But I recognize, God, that you are those things, so I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. That I am weak, that I am lowly, that I am, I'm not compassionate, okay, in those sins. But remember, God, the sins of my youth, don't remember the sins of my youth, God, but according to your loving kindness, remember me. Remember me now. Remember me today and tomorrow. Don't forget me. And not that God would ever forget you, and sometimes we think about that, that God remembers everybody else, God likes everybody else, God just doesn't like me. Who am I? I mean, I'm not a great person, I cause trouble all the time, and I'm just not this great person, right? Not at all. Don't remember the sins of my youth, the sins of my past, okay? Or my transgressions, according to your loving kindness, though, remember me. Don't forget me. What does he say here? For your goodness sake. For his pleasure in a sense. It's not just me, but it's also for him. We are God's creation, right? We are his best creation. However, we have sin. What God has already in heaven, he doesn't need. He doesn't really even need us. But he wants us. How do I know that? Why would any God ever send His only Son down to the earth to die for a creation that sins against Him? Because He loves us. And remember me, God, for Your goodness sake. Because when God remembers you, when God forgives you, 
it all more so just goes back to his compassion and his patience and his loving kindness of who he is. And in verse 8, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And this verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10, again, he recognizes who the Lord is, what he does, what his, his M.O. is, if you will. He leads the humble in justice. He teaches the humble his way. Again, he doesn't want us to fail. He want us, wants us to grow. He's put provisions and ability. He's put his word in the palm of our hands to help us understand, to help us grow. He's given every tool that you need and resource to help you get better. What I want you to notice, if you haven't gotten it already, is the desire here. He's writing to God, he's speaking to God that he, he needs God. In order for him to get better, in order for him to overcome these things in life, he knows the number one source, the only way to do that is through God. And recognizing God's compassion and loving kindness and his grace and that God teaches us and God instructs us, that God is there for us, understanding who He is and His makeup, but recognizing that and promoting that to God, praising God. We just came out of a, a, a Bible class at our, at our church, and we were talking about our prayers oftentimes. Sometimes we ask everything that we need, 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 and we forget just to praise our God. We Yes, we give Him thanks, and that's a measure of praise as well, but just to sit there and praise Him for who He is. But as we turn to God and we ask for those things that we need to get better, as he does in this psalm, he asks for several things, right? Absolutely. But in the way that he also asks him, he also recognizes who he is. Again, the number one source to be able to do these, good and upright, you lead, you have humility and justice. In verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Recognizing also what God has done for them in a covenant relationship. Recognizing that the word of God, the testimonies of God are righteous and true, and those are the things that are going to help you become better. As we recognize the fact that I, I want to be a better person, I want to be a better father and husband and co-worker and brother in Christ, if we stop for just a moment and think about how often are we really trying to get better? Do you strive to get better every day that you get up and oftentimes you do it unconsciously my son he scraped his knee the other day and out of habit what did he do he washed it off he put some ointment on it and put a band-aid on it and why did he do that did i tell him to do it no he knew that there was an error in his body and he wanted it to get better and sometimes we just consciously do that but what I'm afraid of that we're doing is, is that we've got this standard of perfection, this standard of comfortability, okay? And if something's going in our lives that now deviates us a little bit, the desire to be better is to bring us back up to that par level, that comfortable level of that I can operate, that I can have a sense of joy, there's no stress, there's no burden, there's no... Nothing in my life, we can just kind of walk out there and just kind of sing and be married to some measure and just, just be all right. Just kind of be that good moral person. I don't hurt anybody else. They don't hurt me. You know, I, I pretty much get along with everybody, you know. Just kind of that level. But that's not a Christ-like level, though. And I'm afraid that we oftentimes we find that level there and that we say, well, we're good, we're content. And that's exactly who God wants me to be, right? Because, again, I'm not causing any problems. Everything in my life is pretty much okay. And I, I just go through the mundane routine of life, and that's pretty good. I come into church. I'm here. I've read my Bible during the sermon, or I've sang the songs during the class, whatever, whatever it be. But I went out the door, and I just kind of felt like I'm just okay. Are you okay with okay? I often wonder when we read this context how okay David was in this setting here. 
Because even though he may not have current sins, he had past sins that he was still asking for forgiveness for. Although we should have understanding in the New Covenant text that God says, I will remember your sins no more, absolutely. But it's still kind of feeling that sense that, God, I'm still sorry for those things in the past. I'm still sorry for the things that I did in my youth. And if there's something that has happened in the recent past that I didn't recognize, God, let me understand those things, help me to see those things, and I'll turn from those things too. Because I don't want those things to be me. I don't want them to take residence in my life. That's not who I want to be. I want to turn from those things because the only way I'm ever going to get better is I've got to turn from those things. And they can't be who I am anymore. But God, you're, you're great. You're compassionate. You're loving kindness. And you're going to re not remember those sins anymore. But you're going to remember me. And I'm not asking you to remember me to say I'm a great person. I'm an amazing person. Or I'm a king. Or I'm a preacher. Or I'm a anybody else. But God, what I am is someone who loves you, who wants to follow you, and I want to get better because the better that I become, God, I can praise you even more every single day of my life. And that's what he's asking for in this context. And that's what I'm asking for in my life when I read this context. God, don't remember the sins of my past. I've asked for forgiveness of things. I've turned from those things. I know you're a compassionate God, and I know, I know you're loving kindness. But remember me. Don't forget me. And not that God is going to forgive me, but I'm asking God to be with me, to guide me, to help me understand that, God, I have the desire to get in your word, that I have the desire to learn. And the reason why I want to get in your, in your word to learn and the desire to learn is not to sit there and preach a message to somebody else because I want to change my life. And I want to change my life because I want to be that better husband. I want to be that better father. I want to be the better co-worker, the better Christian in my church. And most importantly, God, I want to be a better servant to you because, God, you deserve it. I don't want my enemies to rise up against me, whoever they are in my life. I don't necessarily, God, want you to punish them. I just don't want to deal with them anymore. I want them to get out of my life because I want to grow towards you. He says in verse 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, part of my iniquity, for it is great. So again, the understanding of who I am, and that's not necessarily because he killed someone and committed adultery. The mere fact is that in my life, my iniquity is great. It's great because I committed one sin in my life. It's already great. Opposed to the thousands and the millions we probably already have accumulated in our short time. My iniquity is great if I have one, it's too many. But God pardoned my iniquity. It's again that reassurance of who God is in His position, but also my position. But I'm this creator who, creation who has, who has sinned against you. In verse 12, who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the ways he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secrets of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenants. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. In a nutshell, what he's saying in this entire context is who is the man who fears the Lord? Fearing the Lord is what God is going to do to instruct you. How is it that God could ever instruct us in the way that He should go if we don't fear Him? Fear is in recognizing who He is and reverence and all, but also fear in the fact is if He's instructing us to do this and we choose not to do it, then there's a punishment. There's a penalty involved. And if we don't feel that fear, that punishment, that penalty and all at all, then why at all would we ever do anything that He's instructed us? How many things in the Bible that you know of, that you truly know of, is there? You've read it. And in God says, do this. Or God says, don't do this. But in the flip side, you do that or you don't do that. In return, God has graciously, graciously given us the ability to learn. He's graciously given us the knowledge. He's graciously given us the manual, the tool, in the palm of our hands. And to finally have the understanding of what it is that I must do, God, because I love you and I want to obey you and I want to do everything for you because you truly are a great king. Have that understanding about it and that knowledge and then refuse to do it. I often wonder how blessed we truly think we are. But he says his soul, in verse 13, abides in prosperity. Those who fear the Lord and his descendants will inherit the land. 
Because it's not just the fact that, that it's my benefit that I learn. It's not just my benefit that I grow and get better as Kevin is, but it's the mere fact that those things are going to be passed down to every single one around me, including my children, who will raise up their children, their children, descendants upon descendants. The secrets of the Lord in verse 14 are for those who fear Him. To begin to have that understanding of that reverence and awe of who He is, to come to Him and say, God, I want to know. I fear You, I trust You, and I want to know those things. The world, they don't know it. They don't care to know it. They'll never know it because they don't fear the Lord. And they're missing out greatly because they now don't understand the salvation and the compassion and the loving kindness of God. They don't understand their position and what God's position is to do for us to get us to Him. When we sit down and think, I want to get better, I want to have a better understanding, and God, I fear you, I reverence you, He will reveal so many things to us. And those things are hope. Those things are joy. Because again, those things help us turn towards Him and yet receive His eternal grace. In closing this and bringing all this together, in verse 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies for they are many and they hate me with violent hate. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness, uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O Lord, out of all his troubles. The one verses that got me when I first read this that pierced me hardest was verse 17 and 18, which Gene read. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. pretty confident that I'm not the only one sitting here this morning that could say that statement. On the flip side, I did a Bible class, I don't know, six, 12 months ago. And the Bible class was about encouraging one another, encouragement. And I asked in that, in that Bible, study, Bible study setting, I asked all the members that anyone willingly wanted to, to tell us what your one favorite verse or group of verses is. And you had to choose one. And people would give us theirs, you know, in that moment of distress or the moment of trial, the one that gives you hope, whatever it is, the one that gives you confidence. What is that one Bible verse or set of verses that really just encourage you the most? And mine was John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Where Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my, in my Father's house are many mansions. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, where I am, there you may be also. But the opening verse is, do not let your hearts be troubled. I think one of the hardest parts of us striving to be a better person and striving to be better is that mere thing, how in the world do I not let my heart be troubled? Because it comes so fast and it's so swift. And all of a sudden, just a moment, a blink of an eye, our hearts are troubled. And he says here, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. It's not just one thing that's bothering me. It's multiple things and it's all of a sudden becoming overwhelming and it's pressing me down. Sometimes I wonder here in this statement that he's saying that maybe he doesn't have this full understanding. That's why he's asking God to instruct me and teach me and help me understand your covenant relationships and so forth. He says here in verse 17, bring me out of my distress. How many times have we asked God, deliver me, God? I can't do this. I can't overcome these things. We forget 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation will overcome, overtake you, such as common to man, but God will give you a way of escape also. So that God is there not allowing something to overcome that you can't overcome. But also when those things come your way, He will give you the way of escape. But oftentimes, all we just see is the burdens of our hearts and the burdens of our life. We say, God, bring me out of this distress. And what we're asking God to do is just take that thing, pluck it out of my life, and all of a sudden, now we're just walking happy again. But did you notice what he said in the context? What did he ask God to help him do? To love. Understand. 
how is it that he's asking God here to bring me out of my distress? The fact is the troubles of my heart are large. As if God didn't know that. But God knows all the troubles of your heart. God knows you want and need the deliverance of those things. In verse 18, he says, look upon my affliction and my trouble. Duh. He's God. He knows everything. To ask God to look upon me, look at my life, as if you don't see it, God, is a, is a blatant statement against who God is and what his abilities are. As if we're saying, God, you don't remember me. You don't care for me. And there's so many people in life who said that very statement as well. In other words, God, how am I going to get out of how am I going to get better at things if I can't get out of these things? I've got to get out of these things to get better over here. But one thing we miss, and I know that's not his point in this context. One thing that we miss is the fact is it's through our trials and tribulations that's going to make us better. If we're walking on a beach and seeing the sunset every single day of our life, is that ever going to put faith and trust into God? No. As much as we want that, yeah. That comes later. It's called heaven. I'm not saying there's sunsets and beaches in heaven. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. It's peace and love and harmony, okay? And, and just, it's falling. It's the mere fact is that God understands all those things in your life. And as we go through those things, we put our trust in God. We pray to God. And all of a sudden, He'll bring about that understanding of why we're going through those things in the first place. But also teach us how to get out of those things. How to stand firm and overcome those things. So that if we sin during those things, we have forgiveness through those things. If someone else sins against us, we have the ability to forgive them as well. But also to grow in all aspects of our life to bring us closer to God. In verse 19, Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with, with violent hatred. Again, just having an understanding of who we are, the positions, what's happening in my life. But he says in verse 20, Guard my soul and deliver me. And then he repeats something here. He said in verse 2, Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge all the things that are against him, all the worldly things that are rising up against him of, of its, his enemies, of its own personal sins, all those things. And in the end, God, I'm going to put my trust in you. God, I'm making a commitment. That's a commitment I want you to make today. God, I'm making a commitment that I'm going to grow. And I'm going to draw closer to you. God, I want you to help me to understand your word, to teach me your word, to help me grow in your word. God, I need your help to fear you all the more. And all those things are going to help me draw closer to you. God, don't remember my iniquities. Don't remember my sins anymore. For God, you're compassionate and you have loving kindness and you have mercy. And all those things in the end, and in the end of all this, God, when I do all those things, God, don't let me be ashamed. I think that statement is more so for the speaker and it's more so for God. What this is not, and be very careful here, this is not saying, God, I'm going to do everything for you, so when I'm done with this, God, you're going to give me heaven. This is not, God, I'm going to do everything for you in the end. God, I deserve heaven. What this is, is what God has promised us multiple times. Believe in me. Trust me. Put your faith in me. Follow me. Turn from your sins. And if you do those things, by my grace, that which you do not deserve, even by doing all those things, by my grace, and more importantly, my love, I won't let you be ashamed. We have no clue, no clue other than what we read about, how much God loves us, number one, and no fathomable understanding of what God will do to our enemies, Satan and anyone that has rose up against his children. And no fully fathom understanding other than what John tries to allude to us in Revelation with the fact is the glory that God is going to let us be a part of one day. In no way, shape, or form will God let you go ashamed. Because of his integrity, because of his uprightness, God will preserve you. But as I bring all this to a close and have the understanding, of where do I play in all this? I hope I've alluded to that as we've gone along. And you as well. Here's the thing. Strive to get better. Strive to be a better person. 
strive to be that better Christian. How are you going to do that? Now, for the sake of time, I try to bring this to you real quickly. But what I want you to do in the next couple days is read Psalm 25 once a day. Do it for me for a week. And see where you play into that. And all the more put your faith and your trust and your desire to learn, to grow, to read your word, to assemble together, to study, to be that better person, to be the better father, the husband, the friend, the co-worker, whoever you are, but more importantly, be a better Christian towards God. Recognizing who He is, what He's done for you. And the mere fact, in the grand scheme of all these things, no matter what rose up against you, whether it's Satan, whether it's the world, whether it's other people, that when we stand firm and we are faithful and we trust in Him, we love Him, we obey Him, we follow Him in the grand scheme of things, when it's all said and done, what does He say here in verse 22? Redeem. Redeem Israel as a nation, as a people, out of all God, help me. And that has to be the first thing that you ask Him to do. Christian or not, God, help me. Redeem me. Redeem me from the past. Redeem me from my failures. Forgive me from my lacking of faith and trust and fear. Forgive me from the moments that I didn't share, that I didn't follow you, that I didn't want to get better. But today, I love you. I fear you. I want to be better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to change, and I'm going to grow closer to you. And when it's all said, God, I have all this confidence that you love me so much, I won't be ashamed, but I will be with you for all eternity. Anyone that's subject to that, that desires that, if any prayers at all may come forward now as we sing this song.